My name is Parth. I am an undergrad student at IIT Bombay and I will teach this lecture today. So let's start with neural networks. So the basic building block of neural networks is the perceptron. So uh, I mean, we all know that uh, perceptrons only work well with linear decision boundaries, right? So if we have non-linearly separable data, it, it, it does not work well. But surprisingly, when you combine perceptrons together, you get a, a model which can re really work well. So let's say we have this, uh, this kind of situation. So there are two input variables and uh, the task is to classify them into class A or B. So if, if we use the single perceptron, it's not possible because this data is not linearly separable, right? But uh, let's consider the case when we're using uh, two perceptrons. So this is the first decision boundary and this is the second decision boundary. So if we can somehow combine the outputs of both, we can get a model which can classify this, right? So let's let's assume that uh, this the first perceptron, it uh, gives output one when the data point lies here and the second one gives output one when the data point lies here. So if we combine them together, so let's say uh, th these two weights are for the first perceptron and this is the bias. So this represents the output of the first perceptron and this represents the output of the second perceptron. Right? So let's say uh, we want to uh, classify th this uh, data and let H like, like I mentioned before, let H equal to one signify that the output is above, right? So this is one and this is also one. So H1 and H2 are the outputs of both perceptrons. And if we uh, pass these outputs to another perceptron, so let's say W5 is one, W6 is one, and the uh, activation function is again, the step function at threshold 0 0.5. So let's consider a point here. So th this point uh, for, will have a perceptron output one for both. And if we pass it through this perceptron, so that will be W5 into one plus W6 into one, that's two, and that, uh, that will cross the threshold, so output is one. Again, if we consider uh, a point here or, or a point here, then one of the perceptrons will have output one and the other will have output zero, but again, it will cross the threshold of 0.5 and we will get output one. And for a point here, uh, it has output, the perceptron outputs for both to be zero. So both of these are zero and it is below the threshold. So it will get, it will give output zero, right? So using these, uh, these uh, sequential combination of perceptrons, we have been able to achieve a non-linear decision boundary, which is quite great, right? I mean, uh, it is, uh, it is good that we can do it with perceptrons. And uh, so this is how. Uh, part part. Let's uh, pause for a minute. It's a little. Let's uh, first make sure that this uh, this example is very clear to everyone. Okay. So uh, I'll. Yeah, I'll any questions? yeah. So so go back to that figure. Uh, this yes, figure. Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, we have. And, and, and let's go a little slow. Like so. Like explain everything that A is one class, B is another class, and. Right. 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 Go ahead. So uh, we, we want to classify this uh, two input, uh, two dimensional input into two classes A and B, right? So what we are doing here is we are taking uh, two linear decision boundaries, which, which is equivalent to taking two perceptrons, right? So this first perceptron, it will get output one when it lies in this region, and it will get output zero when it lies in this region. And similarly, we take another perceptron, which will get output one when it lies in this region, and output zero when it lies here, right? So we know that if we can somehow combine these two outputs, we can we can get a decision boundary which will uh, fit for this data, right? So what we what we want to do is uh, we construct a network like this. So the this W1, W3, and B1 correspond to the first perceptron, and H1 is the output of that, and similarly H2 is the output of the second perceptron. So we pass these two outputs through uh, to another perceptron. So W5 and W6 are the weights for those. And let's say for this example that W5 is one and W6 is also one, right? So let's say we have a point over here. So H1 and H2 both will be one for this. And W5 into H1 plus W6 into H2 is uh, two, which is greater than 0 0.5. So the output of this perceptron will be one. Similarly, if you take a point over here, or a point over here, 
uh, for a point over here, the output of the first perceptron is one and the second is zero. And similarly, for a point here, output of the second perceptron is one, first is zero. So W five H one plus W six H two is again greater than point five, right? So the output of this final layer that that is one. And but for a point here, the output of both perceptrons is zero, and that is why. The output from here is also zero, right? So what we have done is uh, we have we have been able to get output one for this this and this regions and output zero here. So we have achieved we have classified this data, right? So uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that when we uh, when we take a combination of perceptrons, we can achieve nonlinear decision boundaries, and it is much more powerful than a single perceptron, right? So right. anyone has questions on this? is it clear that perceptron was a linear boundary and now we are going towards non linear boundaries by combining them this is a question from saurabh depending on the on the output will the inputs be different for each perceptron for classifying point 0 and 1 in the non linear space i don't know if i fully understood did you understand the question part uh, no can you re can you repeat the question saurabh uh, maybe yeah, yeah. go ahead yeah. For classification of point zero and one, will the input be different in I one and I two? Suppose I want to classify zero, so I will only keep the inputs of zero level in I one and and the one in I two. No, so yeah, actually, so. our data is uh, two dimensional, right? So this this yeah. is the first input dimension and this is the second input dimension. So the input here is just the coordinates of the data points. So I one and I two are the two dimensions of, of input which we used to call x one and x two in previous lectures. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so, okay understood. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I one is basically the first dimension of input. So given one sample, its first dimension is I one, input one, and second dimension is I two, which is input two. That's it. Okay, okay, okay. okay. And then uh, I one and I two are both. I one and I two is consumed by perceptron H one. And separately, but perceptron H two. So perceptron one has weights W one and W two, and perceptron two has weights W three and W four. Is that clear? So these are just yes. linear class, sort of yes. like linear classifiers. So uh, Manan, the relation between both figures. Uh, so here you look at H one and H two. Now let's go back to the other figure. one line that you see black and black dotted one of them is h1 the other line is h2 one of one line is implemented by perceptron h1 the other line is implemented by perceptron h2 is that clear okay so one divides one line divides the data into uh, top left diagonal and uh, bottom right diagonal and the other one divides the data into top right diagonal and bottom left diagonal okay so the weights w1 w2 implement one line w2 w3 w4 implement the other line and biases b1 and b2 are associated with one of these two lines okay so i'll continue sir yes so that's okay. yeah so here yeah so these are the biases right so this is just a representation of two perceptrons and we are laying it down like this so it is easier to understand both right and this is how actually the network is formed right so um yeah right, so th this is uh, th this is how we represent a neural network so this is the input layer these are intermediate layers and this is finally the output layer so what we do is we feed in the inputs to these three nodes so these represent uh, one dimension of the input and we get a two dimensional output here and what happens is uh, like at every node uh, it takes inputs from the previous layer so let's say we are considering this node so it will take uh, these three inputs so this is the first weight second weight and third weight so it will take a linear combination of these weights and we will have a function with, which is generally called activation function and we will pass this linear combination through that and we we'll get an output for this node so this is the output of this node yj and then again uh, we'll do it for these three and this these outputs will serve as inputs to this uh, head, second hidden layer right so what happens is um, the data is passed from uh, the input layer to through the hidden layer to finally the output layer 
and uh, it takes a linear combination of the previous layers and passes it to a activation function to give the output okay so uh, the go go back go back hmm. okay. yeah let's pause here so there's a question on what basis are the weights assigned to a single feature so right okay. now yeah go ahead right so actually uh, we are just uh, making a construction of the network what happens is that uh, we will choose a loss function for it and we will train the network so that back propagation is how we do it so we will implement a gradient descent uh, on this and uh, based on uh, and we will find the gradients of the loss function with respect to these weights and then we will uh, tweak them uh, in the corresponding direction to get a better model so right now uh, these are just arbitrary weights and then later we will see how to train them yes so we will train all layers uh, together not one by one uh, and we will see how how we will do that right okay. so here uh, just like in logistic regression or in perceptron where you don't know the weights a priori you don't know the biases a priori you just randomly initialize them and then you do gradient descent on the loss function the same thing we'll be doing here except that we will be training weights of all layers together Okay, so Malan ask. Here, W J is the weight for the sec output of second layer. This is just for this neuron, right? So I mean, each neuron will have an associated weight because it takes a linear combination of all three, right? So if if this is W J, then there will be a weight for this and a weight for this, which will take the linear combination. So this is just for representation that each layer has its own weights. Okay. So what is a layer? layer is basically a group of neurons that take input from only the previous layer and they give output only to the next layer they don't give output to each other within the layer okay, so it's a group of neurons so it's inspired from from uh, the brain brain has uh, different neurons uh, different layers of neurons so for example our visual system has v1 layer v2 layer and then some higher layers and so forth uh, so v1 layer extracts simple features v2 layers extract slightly more complex features and so forth in the visual cortex so now let's uh, look at some other question one is uh, what is the significance of hidden layers so without a hidden layer you just have one neuron one output neuron right or two output neurons and a single neuron can only act as a perceptron or a logistic regression function or a linear svm so a single neuron can only implement a linear boundary to if you want non linear boundaries you need more than one layer you you cannot have just the output layer you need to have at least one hidden layer is that clear sudesh or and uh, is it fair to say that i1 and i2 uh with i1 and i2 we are mapping the whole uh, 2d coordinate system yes so that is for the 2d inputs so if you have three inputs you will have three uh, you will have three neurons in the input layer i1 i2 and i3 or x1 x2 and x3 so the dimension of the input is same as the size of the input layer dimension of the output is same as the size of the output layer number of hidden layers and number of neurons in each hidden layer that is your hyperparameter that's your choice input layer and output layer is not your choice so how do you decide the number of uh, uh, hidden layers or the number of uh, neurons in hidden layers so those are hyperparameters that depends on how complex your problem is and how well it performs on the on the validation data any other questions abhinandan yeah so uh, what i was thinking is like in every layer like we have an uh, in this particular uh, example we have nine neurons right uh, from a three input layer for, to get a first layer we have uh, some nine different neurons here so it can no, we do why, it like, why, why nine neurons uh, because see, we have a three input layer here yes uh, sorry three inputs and for the first uh, uh, hidden layer we have a three nodes right to get yeah, so those, those are the three neurons so the nine are the nine weights not nine neurons neurons are same as nodes the okay. weights are the connection between nodes okay so if we, uh, so do we call the neurons like the different uh, weight the uh, from i to j or from i to a different node 
these are the uh, node is a neuron okay node is a neuron yes okay and so the so, arrows are the weights okay so what i was saying is uh, we, if we have a nine different weights uh, nine different arrows so can mm-hmm. we do it like this like in the for, to get the first hidden layer if we make a 3 by 3 matrix and multiply it with the input layer we are getting the first hidden layer right 3 by 3 matrix yes yeah 3 by 3 matrix multiplied yes. by the input layer you yes. uh, we get the first hidden layer again yes. uh, since in the all the hidden layers we have a same number of hid, uh, nodes so three nodes again three nodes so again we are multiplying with a 3 by 3 matrix yes so can we merge these uh, different hidden layers no we'll come to that in a bit so we cannot merge them but you are right we, it's a three you implement this nine weights as a 3 by 3 matrix yes. and uh, that is how the internal programming on a computer works for a neural network okay okay but we cannot merge them because uh, there is this function f in the above diagram diagram above which is a non linear function that's why you cannot merge them oh okay okay kasina yes sir so uh, the following network with, with the phone um if we have to run it so suppose we have n training examples we have to run it n times right because uh it is training only one uh input data at once right so you remember logistic regression and you remember perceptron which was like logistic regression yeah. or s linear svm which was also like logistic regression they were all linear classifiers for them also if you wanted to train using an iterative algorithm you would run through all the training programs either all of them to get all the training samples either all of them together or in a stochastic order or in a mini batch order that's exactly what we'll do here also except that you don't have just one output you have hidden layers in the in between There is a question by Prasoon. If there are no hidden layers in a network, can we still call it a neural network? It's your choice. It's a semantic question. I, I mean, whether you call a logistic regression a neural network or not, probably not. Uh, I think you need the concept of layers and hidden layers to to call it a neural network. But uh, you can think of logistic regression as a special case, very simple case of a neural network. If you if you insist. Okay, so I move forward. Yeah, so let's. Uh, uh, you are going to explain about the activation function f. Uh, actually, yeah, it is a, a bit a number of slides ahead. So okay. first, I'll explain. Okay. So, Got it. Go ahead. So, like we saw before in this example, uh, right? How we divided uh, the input space into a number of regions, and then for each region, we uh, assigned uh, specific weights to up, uh, to get the best fit, right? so what we can do is let's say we have a one input uh, a one dimensional input and we want to approximate any real value function in let's say an interval from here to here right so it turns out that we can do this with neural networks so what happens is you can consider that the like we divided the original in, input space into separate parts we can divide the real line into separate parts with perceptrons like you can think of it the neurons can act like a dividers and then what happens is we can assign a constant value of to each each interval separately so let, let's say these this has a small number of uh, neurons and that is why it can only approximate it uh, to this degree but as we increase the number of neurons what happens is that we can uh, divide it into much finer intervals and that is how we can get a better approximation for the function right so as you see as we move from here to here uh, the number of intervals increase and the uh, approximation gets better and better so th- this is uh, some kind of some intuition why neural networks work so well and uh, there is also a theorem regarding this it is called the universal approximation theorem so what it states is that a neural network with a single hidden layer so uh, if you remember th- this this is a single hidden layer so let's say we just had the first hidden layer and no hidden layers ahead so this input layer first hidden layer and the output layer so what it's saying is that a neural network with a single hidden layer can approximate any function of the inputs to uh, to any precision given that we we have freedom to choose the number of uh, neurons in the hidden layer right so i think uh, this is a very big result right uh, it is saying that we can 
use a neural network to approximate any function of the input. So uh, finally, we see that we can use. A, uh, so are there any doubts till now? How can it be said? Can you please be? So uh, we see uh, like this. This this is just some intuition to why it should be. The actual proof is quite formal, but uh, if you see this example, you can you can think why it can be true, right? Because as yeah, that I that I am seeing. But uh, is there any uh, kind of criteria? How many number of neuron that has to be there in the hidden layer? No, so that any is, kind of criteria. No, we don't have an upper limit as such. We we the theorem just states that. If you have a freedom to choose the number of neurons in the hidden layer, then you can approximate it to any degree, right? So it's not saying that okay. we can get the function exactly, but we can approximate it. To, uh, we can choose a pretty good approximator for it, right? Yeah, understood. Okay. So yeah, think of it this way. So if you have a single neuron, right? Single single hidden neuron. Uh, uh, so. Uh, so it also has that function f right imagine that function was a step function yeah okay so now these fine fine tessellations that he is showing of the of the function right so uh, yeah here the the blue ones and then finer ones are the red ones even finer ones are the green ones even finer ones are the yellow ones so uh, imagine if you had a series of step functions you could multiply them with some weights some positive some negative weights to create the blue function yeah i get it like that is a sampling theorem kind of thing right right so like if have... if i have some sufficient samples then i can generate yes. any si signal absolutely just like that if i right. have sufficient number of neurons in the layer then i can right. generate right. any condition yeah so with more with finer tessellation you can create the red one even finer you can create the green one and the yellow one now let's go back to that diagram of the neural network no the one with the single input single output uh the one yeah, before this. this before this so here look at the green nodes okay so you are you are trying to map this input x which is in the red node okay so that is the x axis of the graphs the four graphs that he showed before and okay. the output is the the curve that he is trying to approximate the height of the curve that he is trying to approximate in that graph mm -hmm. so the number of step functions is the number of green nodes that you have okay. in the hidden layer so if mm -hmm. you use six of them you will have six steps if you use more of them you will have more steps and you will have a better approximation of what why okay okay so number of hidden neurons gives you increasing the number of hidden neurons will give you better approximation of your output because you mm -hmm. can finally cut the input space with more neurons with more mm -hmm. These those are, who are piecewise linear, but uh, right. mm -hmm. piecewise but linear, and uh, so, but it will actually not be a step function. It will be a smooth step, which is mm -hmm. a logistic function. Okay. Okay. So if you have a sigmoid activation function, then you will have a smooth step. So it will be even better than than uh, uh, I mean, depending on the function. Yeah. Uh, so so if that is clear, then is it clear what is the disadvantage of having too many neurons? too many green neurons hidden neurons overfitting yes absolutely the answer is overfitting uh yash what's your question uh, sir regarding the activation function what kind of activation functions uh, guarantee the universal approximation theorem uh actually it is pretty broad it as long as it is a non linear function a smooth non linear function i think it uh, it doesn't specify that you need to have uh, a particular function yeah so i think uh, this, there is a statement that as long as it is not a polynomial function of the inputs it works right right so is that fine yes uh yeah so yes, i think uh, yes, thank you yeah yes. so when we use for example logistic function it's like an infinite series in x so it it works fine uh what are some other questions why is the error of blue curve less than the green in the approximating real value no the error of the blue curve is more actually than the green right uh, which one is a better example it depends on how many training samples you have if you have more training samples you can afford to have more hidden neurons too much discretization will lead to overfitting yes and it will also be 
computationally expensive. Uh, this is applicable to continuous data only. Uh, not necessarily. You, I mean, it also works with the discrete data. It actually becomes easier with discrete data. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, is that so? We can use neural networks for regression and classification. So what happens is, let's say we want to do linear regression with neural networks. So we can choose the uh, uh, the activation function to be uh, uh, the identity function, and it will give us a linear map, right? So uh, let's say all of these were uh, all of these were identity functions. So what we get is just one perceptron, and we can make a linear model with that. And uh, let's say you want to do holistic regression. So we can choose this to be the sigma function, right? Uh, so what it will do, it, it acts as, as the same as the logistic regress, regressor does, right? It will take a linear combination of inputs and pass it through this activation function to give the output. So uh, the, the loss function we use here is also the cross entropy loss, which we normally use in logistic regression. But uh, when we want to do, let's say, multi-class classification. So what we choose here is uh, called softmax function. So what it does is, Let's say we get uh, outputs for all these layers. So these are some values, and we interpret it. Uh, we want to interpret them as the probabilities for each class, right? So the problem that occurs here is that these values might be negative or greater than one, right? So what we do is, all of all of these inputs are passed to this function. So, so what this function will do is, let's say this is theta one. So it will take it will take e power theta one and divide it by the sum of exponentials of all these thetas. The theta is uh, this uh, linear combination of the input for the previous layer. So what we'll get finally is uh, all of these will be real numbers in zero in the interval zero comma one, right? So this is how we can interpret them as the probabilities for each class. And uh, the loss function we use here again is cross entropy. So is it clear? Okay, so there are no questions. I'll move forward. So yeah, why do we need activation functions? So the uh, thing as I explained before is that if we don't have activation functions before, then you can just see the neural network as a composition of linear maps, right? So um, let's say we are considering this network. So this will be a linear map. Then again, this will also be a linear map, and this will also be a linear map, right? So what this does is it takes a linear combination of inputs. And it does not have an activation function, so it will again take a linear combination of those. And you all know that a linear combination of linear combinations again is just a linear combination. So it will not be able to capture the nonlinear relationships, which is why neural networks are used and are so famous, right? Because yeah. go 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 back to that uh, diagram, the three-layer diagram. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here, uh, one of you previously commented that uh, the weights between the first input layer and the first hidden layer that can be implemented as a three by three matrix, right? And the next one will be let's say so let's say if you have uh, if you have n one neurons in the first layer, then and your input dimension is d, so it will be d cross n one will be the size of the matrix which will capture those those weights w. And then the next one will have uh, n1 cross n2, and then n2 cross n3, right? So let's say n3 is the number of output uh, neurons. So if you if you are multiplying three matrices, you might as well combine them, multiply them, and come make it into a single matrix that goes directly from D to n3. Okay, a matrix of size D cross n3. So if you don't have nonlinear functions, nonlinear activation functions in between. Then there is no point in adding hidden layers. Okay, linear combination of linear functions is again linear functions. So why have an intermediate layer in between? So that is one reason. The other reason is that we want to learn nonlinear classifiers and nonlinear regressors, for which we want to introduce nonlinearity, and that's why there is that activation function. So what does activation function do? That is one of the questions. So what activation function does is it takes a linear combination. See, we always we like working with linear combinations because the math is easy. But our aspirations are to model complicated functions which are nonlinear functions. 
So the activation function starts with something familiar, which is a linear combination, wait times the inputs or wait times the previous player's outputs and so forth. But then after the weights have been multiplied and the biases have been added, it computes a nonlinear function on top of it. So think of neural network as a composition of nonlinear functions. Absolutely. So that's uh, what JD is saying. Um, uh, basically, how logistic regression is uh, between linear regression and log logistic regression, there is a nonlinear step, which is adding the uh, the softmax function or adding the the logistic function or sigmoid function, right? So basically, that's the same thing now we are doing, but not just at the output, also at every intermediate layer. So make so we are making it the first layer becomes a nonlinear feature extractor, second layer becomes feature of features, and the last layer becomes features of features of features that will actually give you the classification or the regression output. Okay, so there's another question of softmax. So I'll explain it again. Yeah. Okay, so what what we're doing in softmax is let's say this is the last, this is the output layer, and the we have taken and passed the input to a neural network, and we get some values for the output layer, right? So what we want to do is we want to interpret each of these as a probability that the input belongs to a certain class. So let's say there are four classes, and we want to classify the input in in one of these. So if these are if these are passed through any activation function, then it's possible that these might be negative numbers or these might be greater than one, right? So to inter we want to interpret it as probabilities for each class. So for that, what we do is let's say we get this to be minus five. So what we we'll do? My let's say this is minus five. This is plus ten. This is plus two. This is plus three. So what we we'll do is for for the we we'll, uh, we'll pass this through uh, the softmax function and the softmax function will take e to the power minus five so e to the power, my, uh, power the value which is obtained here and divided by the sum of all uh, values exponentiated so this, that will be e power minus five e power plus ten e power plus two e power plus three so what this gives us is is kind of a probabilistic interpretation right because uh, e to power anything is is a positive number and now we have normalized it by the sum of all values so these all will sum up to one which makes sense because the probability that it belongs to since it belongs to these four classes uh, the pro individual probabilities must sum up to one and uh, since it is between zero and one we can interpret it as the probability that it belongs to the corresponding class So for two classes, it boils down to same as a logistic function or a sigmoid function. It's a, so that's a binary class, logistic or sigmoid. And uh, here it's, a, it's an n, n uh, generalization of that function. Okay, so it will give you a probability mass function over all classes. So how are we deciding the loss function to use? The loss function, just like how we used uh, in perceptron or in logistic regression, we use cross entropy. We are using the same one now, but not for binary, but for nary. Yeah. So it is it like JD has said. It has it comes from maximum likelihood formulation. Okay. So. Uh, we could have taken mod instead of e power theta why is e used in softmax so i i think uh, the reason why we use exponential is because it's differentiable right using mod is generally a problem because uh, we we want ultimately we want to optimize the network by doing back propagation and gradient descent so for calculation of gradients uh, exponential is a better option right so that's one reason. The other reason is that uh, the maximum likelihood formulation is is a natural outcome of this uh, formulation. Okay, yeah, uh, right. which doesn't really work very well. So we also want all outputs to add up to one, just like a probability mass function. That wouldn't happen if we have uh, mods. Okay, so I move forward right. so what so as i explained we need activation functions because we don't want just a linear transform right we want to we want the model to be able to 
uh, fit into nonlinear data as well. And there are several uh, choices of activation functions. And I've, I've added some of the most common ones here. So I think uh, you, you all know that sigma is the one we use in logistic regression. And TANH is similar to that. Uh, but the advantage is that it has a higher gradient, right? So uh, when we are training a neural network, we uh, generally encounter this problem of uh, uh, vanishing gradients. So when, when we are doing backpropagation, we want the, the weights to uh, adjust to the, in the di negative direction of the gradient, right? But if the gradient is too small, then the network learns too slowly. So TANH uh, gives this added advantage of a higher gradient and that helps in training. And uh, another uh, very popular choice is ReLU. So the, the uh, equation for ReLU is a maximum of zero comma X. So this is the line Y equal to X and uh, for X less than zero, it is just zero. So the advantage of ReLU is that the gradient is uh, constantly one. So even in TANH, there might be some problems while training because the gradient falls off quite quickly in this direction, right? So ReLU is po uh, a popular choice because uh, it, it has a constant gradient of one and it, uh, it helps us to train the model faster. And the final loss function is uh, soft plus. So the equation of soft plus is uh, log of one plus e power x. So it is kind of like uh, a smoothening out the y equal to x function. Uh, right. So these are the four common choices and are there any doubts? Okay. There are no doubts. So I'll move forward. So advantage of multiple hidden there. Okay. So we've seen from the universal approximation theorem uh, that uh, using a single hidden layer, we can approximate any function to arbitrary, to an arbitrary degree, right? So why do we need a uh, more than one hidden layer. So the problem lies in the fact that the universal approximation theorem assumes that we have uh, arbitrary number of uh, neurons for the hidden layer. So uh, what happens in practice is that uh, if you want to use just a single hidden layer to uh, fit into the data, then maybe it requires a very large number of neurons. And th that becomes computationally very expensive, right? I mean, uh, when you're training a network, the the if you consider this transform to be a matrix then the matrix one dimension of the matrix depends on the number of neurons here right so as you are increasing the number of neurons in the hidden layer the number of weights are also increasing very fast and um what happens is if if we use multiple hidden layers uh, then we don't really have any uh, we don't really need those many neurons so uh, it is advantageous to uh, use a like uh, multiple hidden layers instead of taking a large number of neurons in just one hidden layer. And just to give you uh, some intuition about why, uh, multi deep, why multiple hidden layers work. So uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, the, this is, we have captured the activations for uh, Google Net. So ImageNet is a data set which is, uh, which has a, a large number of photos and uh, we want to classify uh, each photo into one of numerous classes. And Google Net is a deep learning model which is used to, uh, used to do that. And Google Net is, uh, it has a large number of hidden layers. So it is quite deep, like you can see this network, right? So it is very, a very deep network and what the, what, uh, we observe is that uh, for the if you consider the inputs which give maximum activation to uh, to each hidden layer what we observe is that for the uh, initial hidden layers it detects very basic things like edges texture but as we move forward the deeper hidden layers so let's say we are considering some layer towards towards the end near the output it captures very very complex features like uh, this is capturing the face of a dog. This is capturing an eye, right? So what, what I'm trying to tell you is that as we increase the number of hidden layers, the layers towards the end tend to capture much more powerful and abstract features. So that is why deep neural networks are, uh, uh, are used very often because the model learns to 
extract its own features of interest and as we move forward it it is able to capture uh, very complex features so are there any doubts till now let's take some questions okay why why don't we give uh, more than one feature to a single neuron what would reduce the number of neurons in a single layer so uh, so a, a single feature what what we mean by feature is output of the previous layer so it, so in the beginning it is just the input dimensions because there is no layer before input layer so uh, so each input dimension is one feature just like we have been talking about before this with linear models now each of those is given to each neuron of the next layer okay so you will see yeah let's just pause here look at each red neuron in the left figure so that is the first neuron is x1 dimension or i1 dimension and it is being connected to all the yellow neurons in the next layer okay so red layer acts as features for the next layer the yellow layer output of the yellow layer acts as features for the blue layer okay so so every feature from the previous layer is utilized by every neuron of the next layer yeah okay so let's yeah any any other questions on why we need uh, more layers so what more layer does is uh, uh basically what it does is that if you want to model a very complicated function right so let's say you have a two dimensional input space and you want a boundary that uh, that has a little bit of an s shape in one place and little bit of an s shape in another place okay so what you can do is uh, you can divide the two regions separately in the first layer and then implement a single s shape in the next layer that will superimpose the two of them so what happens is it it's basically how do you fold the input space and then you utilize the same same types of features more efficiently in the upper layer so basically features of features tend to help exploit symmetries in the in the decision boundary that you might have in in just the input space it with with fewer parameters with fewer weights if you want to do that the same kind of boundary with just a single hidden layer it is possible because of universal approximation theorem but it will require a lot more neurons in the first layer itself yeah. is that clear uh amit sir just one small doubt i had uh, is yeah. that when we are selecting the number of neurons in a layer versus how many layers we are supposed to have so if somebody yeah. has to make a decision in that respect so like how what's a good intuition to follow in that situation it's a black art <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh if you are modeling something simple in the sense that you have a chemical plant you want to measure you want to predict when certain pressure condition will be violated based on your inputs are five different sensors then probably a single hidden layer is fine if you want to classify images right and in images you have first features are edges of different orientation second features are combination of edges maybe third fourth fifth layer is parts of a body or parts of a different object classes and then the final layer is whether that object is present or not right so their feature of features you are reusing things like bar detectors right or line detectors so their multiple layers are helpful i don't know if i can give you any better answer than that uh it, because I, i don't think the community neural network community itself fully understands maybe jd has something to add so like in terms of layman uh, terms think of these layers as suppose you have these biological cells right so at the lowest level you have cells multiple cells combine to make tissue so that can be the second layer right then multiple tissues create a a, a kind of an organ so that can be your third layer multiple organs create a kind of a a small subsystem like nervous system respiratory system and eventually you end up getting an organism right 
so think of these layers as it's kind of creating these smaller and smaller combinations of uh, these cells tissues and organs and eventually at the end you get a visual representation of what a person is like right so think of this uh, this as a rich feature extraction along the layers until you start seeing oh this means a car or at the last layer you would see kind of a visual map which probably would say oh this is a kind of a car or a person or a plane something like that so if that helps you, that is one example that really helps you understand these rich feature extractions. Okay, Ritik, you have a doubt? Sir, uh, so basically uh, each input layer uh, will be considered like each input uh, where we pass in a feature and the other, uh, and the other hidden layers uh, where the uh, hidden layer contains a basically function uh, where the inputs comes and hidden layer will compute an output which is basically gives an output in the form of weights so each layer will compute that weight and so we are keep optimizing the weights as like stochastic gradient descent or any gradient descent or minimizing the uh, mean square error right so you will be minimizing the mean square error or, or the cross entropy with respect to layer uh, the weights of layer last layer second last layer third last layer all the way up to the first hidden layer okay thank you sir and then uh, divya has a question so is it pure trial and error and intuition experience and no definite rule i wouldn't say that there is no definite rule there are people who are working on the theory of neural networks that how many layers are necessary how how many neurons in each layer but uh, they, those work only on toy examples on large useful examples it hasn't worked very well i mean it has not been able uh, probably the computations were too expensive or or the predictions were not very good so it has not shown good results yet for how to design neural networks from scratch in a principled manner rahul rahul you have a question Okay. Kasina is asking, so can we say that the number of layers and the number of neurons are hyperparameters? Absolutely. That's exactly what they are. Oh, wait, JD already answered that. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'll move forward. Yes. Yeah, so uh, one uh, major problem we en encounter while training neural networks is overfitting. Right? So uh, as we know that neural networks are very powerful arbitrary function approximators and that is probably why it is uh, they are prone to overfitting because the training data can only represent some part of the universe right and if we try to fit a, an extremely complex model on that we'll probably get something which is not able to generalize well and which is memorizing the training examples more so if you see these two graphs so this uh, the green curves represent a simpler model and the purple curves represent the errors for a much more complex model. So this top curve is the generalization error and the bottom curve is the training error. So as, when the training examples are quite less, you see that um, a complex model will give you a much smaller training error, but it does not generalize well. A simpler model tends to generalize well if we have a lesser number of training examples. And as the number of training examples increase, then you can think that they are representing the entire universe of uh, train uh, entire universe uh, better right so that is why the more complex model tends to uh, generalize better in that case and the training error of a complex model is you, almost always lesser than that of a simple model so this is another graph which uh, which explains model complexity so uh, as you see that uh, when when we increase model complexity, the training error generally reduces. But uh, there comes a point when uh, the model becomes complex enough, and if you try to get a more complex model than that, then it will generalize. Well. Uh, it will not generalize well, and it will overfit the data. But the generalization error will increase. So what we want is for a good model to have. Uh, generalization error that is not too far from the training error. So, uh, what uh, one of the methods to prevent overfitting is 
to limit the number of neurons right so as we increase the number of neurons the number of parameters in the network increases and th these complex models tend to overfit much and uh, limiting the number of neurons will give us a simpler model which will probably generalize well another way to prevent overfitting is early stopping so the method we saw before uh, it involved changing the model but uh, what early stopping does is let's say we are training a neural network and uh, as the number of uh, training steps increase we expect the training error to go down but after a certain point of time uh, the validation error will start to increase so early stop what early stopping says is that uh, when we see that the validation error is starting to increase at we should stop training at that point and use the model weights we have obtained till now so it, it it is kind of like getting the best generalization from the model you have designed uh, is that clear yeah generalization error is the error you get when, when you are trying the model on unseen data okay so uh, another way to prevent overfitting is to use weight decay or l2 regularization so uh, what happens is that if if while training we see that the weight of some neurons is too large compared to the weights of other neurons then the model acts as if it's very strongly influenced by the features that neuron captures so um, and you know that this will lead to bad generalization right so it is becoming much more uh, the training example specific so what weight decay will do is uh, to the, it will add an extra term to the loss function so let's say this was your original loss function this can be mean square error or soft uh, uh, cross entropy and on top of that we have a lambda by 2 multiplied by the sum of weight squared so let's say this is a neural network so each of these lines has a weight associated with it right so this mod w square is the sum of square of all these weights so each of these so that for a deep network that will be a large number of weights and what we want to do is we want to minimize this new loss function so th this second term which we add it kind of it gives a penalty to large weights right so if any one weight is too large then it it will give a higher loss and what we want to do is we want to minimize this so the model tends to choose the set of weights which with give a good balance between these two so this uh, diagram here shows uh, how uh, efficient how weight decay helps us so uh, this lambda is a hyperparameter right so if we choose a very large lambda then the model weights are penalized very highly so the model will tend to choose a model weights which are much smaller and what happens is this generally leads to underfitting because the model is not able to uh, work well with the training data as well since we have imposed a large penalty on the weights and if we choose a very small lambda lambda 4 then uh, the model tends to overfit because we are not penalizing the weights enough and maybe some of the weights are beginning to influence the model output too much so this is the gradient descent step equation for weight updation so this is the weights at uh, after the step and this is the weights before the step minus this is the normal gradient descent uh, alpha delta loss and this is the extra term due to this regularization weight decay term so are there any doubts now okay so i'll move forward right so before we move on to back propagation uh, i i just want to introduce this concept of computation okay there are two doubts here uh, rithik ask uh, uh, sir we can use uh, can we use uh, l1 norm like like what's the difference if we use uh, l2 norm or l1 norm yeah, so l1 norm is another loss function uh, amit sir will you answer this yeah so l1 norm uh, theoretically you can use it but uh, the the idea of l1 norm is that uh, when you add l1 norm you want to drive some weights to zero 
okay because you want uh, you wanted a sparse output uh, sorry you wanted a sparse model right so what we sh showed with those uh, lasso with th those uh, rhombus shaped uh, attractors was that uh, the the loss curves will graze one of the corners and then if it grazes one of the corners the other variable will be uh, the other weight will be set to zero uh, now that is not really our goal here we we will we don't gain much by setting some weights of the neural network to zero so we really don't use it the theory for uh, regularization for of uh, l using l2 norm is much better better developed and it is understood much better other than the fact that l1 norm will give you uh, sparse weights so l is a uh, uh l is the loss here here l is the loss so loss means uh, it is either mean square error l data is either mean square error or cross entropy and the other part of the loss is the mod of w square yes sir yeah ramohan yeah could you please explain the w part again like what does w represent over here i can't imagine like sum of all the weights because then if the w is higher than which will which weight will be assigned the penalty that i don't know how it will assign that no actually it is exactly what you were afraid to think it will it is a sum of square of all the weights of the neural network not the biases just the weights but then so let's say that one weight is one weight has really high magnitude but yeah. here we have sum of so many weights then how yeah. will you assign the penalty to that particular weight so now look at the lower equation there the w is small in the upper equation w is capital when we it is capital it is basically all the weights when it is small that it is one particular weight okay so you are computing the update of one particular weight in t plus 1th step by using what it was in the previous t step okay minus some learning rate times gradient of the entire loss okay with respect to that particular w okay okay so here what you have is uh, uh, so one is the, the the gradient of the data loss and the other is the gradient of the w w square loss okay okay so okay. you have w1 square w2 square w1 million square right all of these are added yeah. now if you if you take deri partial derivative with respect to only w 100th square then all the other ones don't matter only that one will remain yes okay, sir. so lambda times that w 100 yes sir one more question sir so in the early in the last slide when we were we had early stopping yeah what is the exact condition that we would use for early stopping because so uh, testing error can like testing error or validation error can go like can jump up and down we can't just say that whenever yeah. it starts yeah 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 so these are uh, nice looking cartoon graphs they are only a guideline so what would be a good condition for testing this happily yeah you would observe it for maybe 10 iterations and then take the average of 10 iterations something like that okay so you so will smoothen it yeah you will smoothen it out thanks yeah kasina thank you sir yeah we can't hear you can you'll have to repeat your question or maybe uh, ask in the chat ha uh, part can, you can you hear him or no no sir i can't hear him okay kasina maybe type your question any other questions so uh, let, let let me just add a little bit to the neural network right so we we in machine learning we always have problems with we we want more data and we want to model complex functions right so sometimes we cannot get more data sometimes the data is really like only 1000 samples right 1000 uh, samples would be considered small data in today's day and age so if you just have 1000 samples then you can't fit complicated models 
uh, if you have more data and you want the complexity of the model, some way to scale the complexity of the model by playing with the model design and the hyperparameters, what choices do you have in logistic regression? You have no choice at all. There is no hyperparameter or, I mean, only the, the regularization is a hyperparameter, nothing else. So maybe you'll regularize it less, but even with a lot of training samples, it will only fit a linear line, linear decision boundary. What choice do you have in, uh, in uh, random forest, you really have a choice because your trees can now become deeper and deeper. The number of trees can become more and more. Uh, what choice do you have with the uh, SVM so that your model complexity increases with the number of data? Uh, you can decrease the some of the hard thresholding penalty. Uh, you can in, you can introduce a kernel. You can reduce the kernel width and you can increase the number of support vectors by playing with the regularization penalty. Okay, so these are your choices. In neural network, you get two choices. You get the choice of increasing the number of neurons in one layer and also increasing the number of layers. Okay. So that comes with its advantages and disadvantages. We'll look at disadvantages also at some point. Yeah, so too many layers will lead to too many hyperparameters like Chinmay has said. Uh, so, but uh, too many, uh, so too many parameters is okay as long as you have a large amount of data to support training a very complicated model. And it also actually shows you good results on validation data. So Kasina's question is, uh, so here we can't differentiate. Sir, am I audible? Yes. Uh, so yeah, uh, I can ask it. Yeah. So what I mean to say is, uh, could you go to the slide where we discuss the regre uh, sorry, uh, regularization L2? Yeah. So here uh, you said that it, the W is sum of all the weights of all the layers, right? Right. So Capital in w. a linear, yeah. So normally in linear regression, uh, mm -hmm. when we have to compute the loss, we differentiate a W with respect to X, correct? No. But no, here, no, no, no. With respect to W. Sorry. No. With respect to w. single W. Okay. Each W separately. Fine. So what is a gradient of a function? Gradient takes multiple inputs. Yes. Sorry, a, a function that takes multiple inputs. So here we are thinking of not the inputs as inputs. We are thinking of weights as inputs. Okay. Because you're, you, you are really changing the weights. You're not changing the training samples. Yeah. Right. You're changing yeah. weights, iteration over iteration. You're not changing the training sample. Training sample yes. is what the hand was dealt to you. Okay. So, so you can we... think of loss as... You can think of it in two terms. You can think of it as X is fixed and you're changing W, or you can think of W as fixed and you're changing X. When you're training, you're changing W. Okay, it's the same equation here also. Okay. Can someone else take questions? I need to go a step out. Okay, yes, you have a doubt? More than a doubt, it was just a simple comment that uh, if we have a simple if we have very few samples right. then one one way to deal with it is to take a pre-trained complex model and uh, yeah mount two or one one maybe one or two more layers over it uh, so you can yeah, take, so I think... yeah that that complex model can actually be interpreted pre-trained complex model for example that google net what you talked about yeah. uh, that can actually be used to extract better features yeah, yeah, so I think what you're talking about is transfer learning. So yes, we will exactly, cover this exactly. more in the deep learning module. So this is just okay. an introduction to neural networks, right? Right. Okay, so Thanks. I move ahead. Right, so computational graph. So what we want to do ultimately to train a neural network is to uh, find the derivative of the weights with respect to the loss, right? But it is not really easy for uh, a complex neural network if you want to find the weight the loss with uh, the gradient with respect to each weight so computational graphs is a framework like uh, it is uh, an idea which we can use to uh, find uh, the gradient with, with respect to loss so let's say you have a very complex network like this right so we have so many weights and uh, finding the gradient for each weight individually is a uh, very difficult task right so 
uh, let, let's uh, begin with a uh, computational graph. So let's say you have a three variable function f of x, y, z, and uh, the function is 2x plus y times z. So uh, what we want to do uh, while making a computational graph is we want to break the function into uh, small uh, computations. So, oh, okay, there are some chat questions. Okay, so JD, thanks for answering. So what we want to do in computational graphs is we want to uh, break uh, the function into small uh, computations so that we, we, we know the derivative of each individually, right? So to, so this is quite a simple example, but what we want to demonstrate here is that uh, we can break 2x plus y times z into uh, uh, for first computation uh, calculating 2x plus y and then multiplying it by z. So let's say we want to find the gradient of this function with respect to x, y, z. So back propagation is, comes here and uh, what the idea for back propagation is, since we have broken each uh, computation into, uh, since we have broken the function into small, uh, simple computations, we can find the gradient for each computation. And then uh, we can use the chain rule to, to get the final gradient of the input, right? So, Let's say we want to find the gradient of this function with respect to x. So what we'll do is, uh, this is the function uh, 2x plus y times z. So first we'll uh, find the gradient of f with respect to a1. So a1 is the first simple computation we know. I, this gradient is quite easy to find out because a2 with f is just a1 times z. So the gradient of uh, this with respect to a1 is just z. And then we know del f by del a1. And similarly, from here, we can find the derivatives of uh, a1 with respect to x and a1 with respect to y. So these partial derivatives are simply 2 and 1, right? So what we have done with the computation graph is we have broken each computation into simple computations where we know the gradient for each, uh, for each of these. So finally, if we want to calculate del f by del x, so what we can do is we can multiply these gradients because del f by del x is del f by del a1 into del a1 by del x, right? This is the chain rule. So similarly, if we want to calculate del f by del y, we can use this again. So that will be z into one. And del f by del z will be just a1. So uh, is, is this idea okay for computational graphs? uh did everyone understand the motivation why we are doing this right so yeah so because we want to compute the gradient of the error which is at the output layer even actually after the output layer when we are computing the output with the target value and we want to compute its derivative with respect to a weight which is much further away from it towards the input layer input layer or the first towards the like let's say the first hidden layer or the second hidden layer so it's so far away and we want an algorithm to compute it we don't want to derive it by hand for very complicated neural networks so the algorithm to to did to compute that gradient is to form a computational graph and then just back propagate based on chain rule okay uh, compute the product of partial gradients partial derivatives uh, using chain rule. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so let's take another example. So let's say we want to consider, we want to find the gradient of this function with respect to x, right? So this function is quite uh, complicated, right? We have log, we have 2x plus 1, we have sin x. So we can first make a computational graph for this. So we'll split each of these into uh, small units where we know the backward gradient. So let's say we split the first this plus sin x into a, a1. So we know del a1 by del x, right? It is just cos x. Similarly, we, we split this into uh, a2, which is 2x plus 1. And then after that, we take log a2. And this is x squared. So how, the way to read this graph is from x, we calculate a2, we calculate a4, and we calculate a3, we merge them to get a5, and we merge a5 with a1 to get a6. Right. So now if we want to calculate the derivative of f with respect to x, we want to back propagate to each of these simple calculations. And using the chain rule, we'll merge the gradients as we go backward. So let's say we want to back propagate here. Uh, 
okay so we'll use we first calculate the derivatives of a6 with respect to a1 and a5 so what makes computational graph so uh, so good is that each each of these derivatives is quite easy to calculate right so this is just a6 is a5 plus a1 so del a6 by del a1 is 1 and del a6 by a5 is also 1 now uh, from here to move backwards we calculate del a5 by del a3 right so a5 is a3 into a4 so the derivative of a5 with respect to a3 is just a4 and finally we calculate del a3 by del x which is 2x so uh, similarly we can calculate del a5 by del a4 which is a3 because this is just a product after that a4 is log a2 so del a4 by del a2 is 1 over a2 and del a2 by del x is 2 uh, and finally for uh, this part del a6 by del a1 is 1 and del a1 by del x is cos x so finally what we do to merge these gradients is we'll calculate the gradient of each part from x to the final uh, a6 and then we'll add the gradients on each part so the first part is 1 times cos x the second part is 1 times a3 times 1 over a2 times 2 so 1 times a3 is x square 1 over a2 is 1 over 2x plus 1 times 2 and the third part is 1 times a4 times 2x so 1 times a4 times 2x so what we uh, like uh, this, we have made this very modular right so this is something you can code as such because each of you can store the gradient for each computation and then you just have to define these cells and after that you can directly implement the approximation by multiplying the upstream gradients here so is this fine and i think uh, the reason to do this probably is uh, you avoid recomputations when you have to keep going over this computational graph again and again during every iteration right uh, right so you can you can store each of these gradients internally and then you can just do a uh, like a look it's like a look, look up table where you just look into it and bring that uh, gradient of that edge right yeah otherwise it's basically class 11 12th uh, chain rule right but yeah. to avoid ourselves computing it again and again again and again for thousands of iterations for different kinds of weights so we probably store it or probably tensorflow already does this right in terms yeah. of okay. autograd or something okay so uh, i think this is clear right Okay, so uh, for uh, this map recognition is what we'll use in neural networks. Okay, Rithik, you have a doubt? Sir, actually my internet is a bit off, so, so can you please explain me back propagating once again? Just a brief, like. Okay, okay. Yeah, so I'll explain for this example. So you did you understand how the computational graph was drawn? Yes, sir, yes. Okay, so what we are doing here is, uh, the computational graph tells us how x is affecting the function right so this is one path corresponding to the sine x this is another path corresponding to this log 2x plus 1 and this is the third path x square and these two merge together to, to give this term right so let's say you want to calculate the gradient of this function so when you're applying chain rule this is what you're actually doing right so first you calculate uh, the derivative with respect to sine x you get cos x and uh, this term is gone and now after that you keep one constant and you differentiate the other and then you combine both so this is what is happening here right so this this is where you combine the grid this is where you combine the gradients and uh, get the individual ones back so let's say you want to calculate the gradient uh, del a1 by del x so what we'll do is first we'll calculate del a6 by del a1 which is since a6 is a5 plus a1 the derivative is 1 then then this is the gradient will multiply with the gradient del a1 by del x to get del a6 by del x. Uh, is, that, is this fine? Yes, sir, yes. So similarly, we'll do this for all parts and we multiply them because we have the chain rule, right? So as we are going back, we, we are multiplying the partial derivatives with respect to each of the intermediate variables, right? So here we have del a6 by del a5, then del a5 by del a4 and this is the chain rule, right? So that is exactly what we're doing. 
Okay, so I'll move forward. So this path pro- the idea of path progression is the reason why training neural networks has become uh, so easy. I uh, we have we also have frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch which which do it for us. So uh, we'll derive gradient descent for uh, of neural network now. And uh, before that, uh, I'll just introduce a few uh, results that we'll use. So let's uh, the first result is. we we'll use the jacobian chain rule so i'm uh, we are using the convention for chain rule as let's say y is a function of x right so when we want to calculate the gradient of y with respect to x uh, this is the jacobian view so this is the first dimension of y and the first row is the derivative of, partial derivative of first dimension of y with respect to each of these axes and The, uh, the second row is the the derivative of second dimension with each each input, right? So let's say you have l as a function of y and y as a function uh, y as a function of x. Then the Jacobian chain rule for this convention tells us that the gradient of l with respect to x is the product of gradient of l with respect to y and gradient of y with respect to x. So one thing to remember here is that both of these uh, can be matrices, right? So this is the matrix product of both. and using this uh, and one more thing so if y is a linear transform let's say y is equal to w into x so this is what we do uh, before the activation function for a neural network right we multiply the uh, the feature vector with a matrix so if you want to calculate uh, the gradient of y with respect to x we know from this definition that uh, gradient of y with respect to x the ij term is del y i by del x j right so Uh, this this is the linear transform right this is y and this is uh, the weight matrix w multiplied with the x x vector so you see that del y i by del x j is just w i j because uh, y i is a linear combination of all these it is w i1 x1 plus w i2 x2 up to the last dimension and the gradient with respect to x j is just w i j so this is a pretty uh, compact result we get that for a linear transform y equals w into x uh, the gradient of y with respect to x is just w for this convention of jacobian okay so uh, are there any doubts till now okay i'll move forward the second result we we'll use is that let's say l is a loss function right so l is the scalar and x comma y are vectors and w is the matrix such that y is the linear transform of w and then it is passed through some function f so you can think of f as the activation function here and y is uh, the linear combination which we pass through the activation function so uh, ultimately for uh, training neural networks we need the gradients with respect to these weights right so what we are deriving here is that the the matrix form of the grid, the the derivatives of the weights dw where the ijth element is defined as del, uh, the derivative of l with respect to the ijth weight this is given as dw equals uh, the gradient of l with respect to y transpose times the gradient with respect to x tra- the uh, times x transpose so if you think of how uh, wij affects uh, yi Uh, how w i j affects l so we know that l is a function of y and w i j only affects y i right because uh, we, we we can see from this transform that uh, w i uh, all the other y i don't depend on w i j and only y i depends on w i j so uh, the the gradient of l with respect to w i j is just x j right and that is exactly what the uh, ijth element of this product is because the ith element of this uh, gradient l with, with respect to y transpose is del l by del y i and the jth element of x transpose is x j so the ijth element of this matrix which are uh, which are denoting by this product is just del l by del w i j so this is exactly what we want right so we, what we wanted was a matrix where the ijth element is a derivative of the loss with respect to that weight 
so that we can uh, we can uh, do an updation of w to w minus uh, alpha times dw right that is how we do gradient descent so is this clear or please feel free to ask any doubts if you have can you explain it one more time okay so uh, first part yeah so what we want to do here is we want to find a matrix such that the ijth element of the matrix is the derivative of the loss with respect to that weight so ultimately for gradient descent we want to subtract we want to subtract uh, each weight by the uh, by uh, alpha times the the derivative of the weight right so if we have a matrix where the, each element is the derivative of that weight we can simply subtract this dw from w to get, to implement gradient descent right so so let's see what the ijth element of dw uh, should be so it should be del l by del, del del w ij and we know that w since l is a function of y and w ij only affects l through yi so del l by del w i j should be this exactly this right uh, is this uh, are you able to understand this no not this part last part you have said you are trying to convince is not convincing me okay so we know that l is a function of this y vector right so if we want to calculate the gradient of l with respect to this weight w i j we we want to see we, we want to find like the gradient uh, how is the gradient calculated for a mul uh, multi variable input function so it is the summation of all these y i's summation over all these y i's of del l by del y i times del y i by del w i j right i mean we, we want to see how w i j affects each of these and then we use the chain rule to multiply the gradients is this okay no oh, fine no it's clear not clear yes yes now it's clear okay okay so we see that wij affects only this ith dimension of y so that is why uh, this product del l by del y i times xj is exactly the gradient del l by del wij and now we have we know how to calculate this matrix dw given that we know Uh, the gradient of l with respect to y right so uh, let's move on to a neural network let's say these are two layers maybe maybe they are hidden there this is the layer l minus 1 this is the layer l so uh, the computation for the, the layer l is that uh, we first calculate the linear combination xl which is wl times yl minus 1 so this this is a matrix and this is a vector so this is a matrix times vector which gives us another vector so if you see here what what we have found out is given a linear transformation we know how to calculate the gradient of the weights if we know the gradient of this right so here xl is the y we used here and uh, w yl minus yl minus 1 is the x here Right, so the linear transformation is x equals w time x l equals w times y w l times y l minus one. So the so here we use the chain rule. The chain rule tells us that the derivative of l with respect to x l is derivative of l with respect to y l times the gradient of um, the gradient of y y l with respect to x l. So we know that. the the way we calculate yl is we take a element wise uh, activation function right so let's say we want to calculate the first element of yl so we will we we'll have an activation function f and we will pass xl the first element of uh, the first element of xl through the activation function f to get yl so del yl by del xl will just be the activation function so i am denoting, denoting it by g here so g prime Excel of the first, the first dimension of Excel, 
so that is why we can write uh, the gradient of l with respect to xl as this element wise product and uh, let's say we have uh, the gradient of l with respect to xl so given uh, gradient of l with respect to xl if we can find the gradient of these weights w this, so this is the weight matrix wl so we can find dwl and the gradient of xl minus 1 the previous one then we know that we can do this for each layer right so we have the gradient for the last layer because we know the loss function and from from the last layer we find out the gradient of weights of the last layer and this gradient for the second last layer again then we can apply this same uh, updation rule tool to get the gradients of the second last layer and so on so the gradient of l with respect to y l minus 1 so y l minus 1 is the output here this is y l minus 1 and uh, xl is wl times y l minus 1 so we'll use the jacobian chain rule here to get gradient of l with respect to y l minus 1 is gradient of l with respect to xl times w so this is what we used here right uh, this is the gradient of um xl x the gradient of xl with respect to y l minus 1 is w and this is the chain rule that the gradient of l with respect to y l minus 1 is gradient of l with respect to xl times gradient of xl with respect to w y l minus 1 so this is what we get and now we know that since we have the gradient of l with respect to y l minus 1 we can use what what we had used here the element wise product of these two so from the gradient of l with respect to xl we have calculated the gradient of l with respect to xl minus 1 so from the gradient of l with respect to the inputs of this the xl of this layer we have calculated the gradient of, with respect to xl minus 1 of this layer so uh, and now we can also calculate dwl as we had derived before so we have derived dwl as for a transform the y equals wx dw is the gradient of l with respect to the output of the uh, linear transform y times uh, transpose times the input transpose so here uh, we have the output as xl so dw is uh nabla l with respect to xl transpose times y l minus 1 transpose so this is the input of the linear transform and this is the output of the linear transform and we have we have a formula to calculate the gradient of these weights uh, okay so someone raised your hand uh, kasina ask yeah but uh, in the first line of these three formulas like Uh, gradient of uh, l with respect okay, to y of uh, l yeah. minus yeah could you explain how you got that formula okay so what we know is that l l is a function of the loss function is a function of these xl right hmm. and xl is calculated as this linear transform so hmm. this is uh this is the jacobian rule so the gradient of l with respect to y l minus 1 is gradient of l with respect to xl so xl is a function of y l minus 1 right times the gradient of okay okay xl with respect to y l minus 1 which we derived as wl is that okay the complex chain rule yeah yeah the jacobian chain rule i mean it, it's a vector right so that's why we are using gradients here yes sir So is the is the increasing order of complexity clear to everyone? We have a function f, which is uh, which is a function of uh, let's say a single w, right? So then you would just derive the derivative of df by dw. If it is a function of w1, w2, w3, and w4, then you will take partial derivatives of f with respect to W one and then with respect to W two and with respect to W three and W four. So here I'm assuming that the function itself is a scalar valued function. It gives you only one output. It doesn't give you multiple outputs. So if you have one one function, one parameter, sorry, one function output, one parameter, then you have regular derivatives. 
you have one function output, but multiple parameters, then you get gradient vector. If you have a vector valued function and a vector valued adder, so you have multiple parameters and you have multiple outputs, then you'll get this matrix, matrix of partial derivatives. So thinking in terms of matrices makes the computation much easier and simpler to write. The initial learning curve is a little bit higher because of understanding the matrix, but after that it's much easier because then all you need to do is uh, multiply the Jacobian matrix from from the outermost layer to the next outermost layer, all the way up to the first hidden layer, and that's that would be the chain rule of derivatives in a matrix form. Okay, so since we we have, what we have derived is given the uh, given this gradient with respect to the XL of this layer, we have found a way to calculate the gradient of L with respect to these weights, and also the gradient of L with respect to XL minus one. So we can see why we can repeat this for previous layers, right? Because we are using the same thing again. We are, we have this we have the formula derived given. Given the gradient with respect to XL, we can calculate the gradient with respect to weights in this way, and we have also derived how to calculate the gradient of the X of the previous layer. So we can use this again for the previous layer till we go back to the first layer, and this is how we can calculate the gradient of L with respect to all the weights. Since the weights are matrices, uh, we get this to also be a matrix where each element. Is the gradient of L with respect to that weight? Uh, are there any doubts? Okay, so JDI has suggested a link. I think we should also check that out, and maybe it will make it a bit more clearer. Auto differentiation is also built on back propagation. Uh, sorry, can you repeat your question? Yeah, auto differentiator is being used uh, nowadays, so it is also built uh, on the principle of back propagation. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So what you see in uh, the popular frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch, they use uh, back propagation to calculate the gradients or the auto grad, what you call. It. Thank you. So, if you ever have to write your own uh, uh, custom layers which are not in a library, okay, then you would need to worry about how to compute the the Jacobian of that layer. You would need to compute the. You would need to uh, define a class for this new type of layer where you define both the forward part of the layer that how the forward computation will happen. And the backward computation will happen. So backward computation is basically the computation of the Jacobian of uh, that uh, layer's output with respect to that layer's input, in uh, output vector with respect to the input vector. Uh, part which slide were you talking about? Uh, sir, this is the last slide. Okay. Okay. So, any yeah. questions? Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, could you, could you, Parth? Could you go to the first slide uh, of back propagation? Just want to see that formula once more. Yeah, this one. Uh, what about the next slide? Yeah, I wanted the previous one itself. Yeah. I'm taking screenshot. Is that fine? Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot. Okay.
so uh, there is a question shouldn't we have simpler activation functions like sigmoid will complicate the calculation actually no activation function will complicate the calculation as long as you can store its uh, derivative uh, you can compute its derivative very quickly or you can compute its uh, or you can store it in a lookup table so it's not really a problem but uh, there are advantages of some activation function over others so uh, part did we cover relu versus sigmoid yes sir actually i had mentioned that uh, sigmoid has the vanishing gradients problem right yeah so is is vanishing gradient problem clear to everyone so let's say you have a uh, weight if let's say you in your weight is such that most of your inputs multiplied by the weight Uh, come in the flat region, either the left flat region or the right flat region of the red curve, of the sigmoid curve, or the tan h curve, right? So in that case, your gradient will be zero, and your weights will not be updated, or they will have very small updates. Gradients will be almost zero. So now the problem is because you are multiplying Jacobian of the last layer with the Jacobian of the second last layer with the Jacobian of the third last layer. so all these gradients get multiplied in a chain and if you have very small gradients the gradients vanish by the time they reach the first layer or on the other hand if the gradient is very large then they all get multiplied in very large with other very large numbers as you go back into the neural network and then you have an exploding gradient so you will very very quickly get a nan value for your weights within an iteration or two so weight initialization so that they are not very small and not very large is also something you need to take care of and uh, there is something called zavier initialization which is almost a default now so which basically computes uh, which bas basically tells how to even if you randomly initialize the weight let's say all weights have you know you initialize weights using a normal distribution zero mean and plus minus sigma what should that sigma be so that even you know when you start training it you don't run into a vanishing gradient or an exploding gradient problem yash you have a question uh, yes sir a small question regarding relu uh, when we are in the negative side it does not give any gradient right right so, right so can we not get stuck at a bad position yeah we can theoretically but uh, the assumption is that uh, if if you randomly initialize then let's say for half the inputs you will be on the positive half for half the inputs you will be on the negative half whereas that uh, region of non zero gradient in sigmoid can be very small if the weights are very large okay so when the weights are very large the step will become much steeper yeah. from 0 to 1 it will be happen much quickly in very small Uh, interval but uh, you know around zero only when the weights are small that it will be like very flat uh, not very flat it will be slowly rising from very left of the negative range to very right of the positive range okay, so that problem is not there with relu so we are hoping that at least half of the inputs or at least some of the inputs will uh, will activate the neuron in the positive half and you will get some gradient other than that the all these activation functions have their own uh, special uses relu is a very good general general purpose non linear activation that you can use in hidden layers but you cannot use it in output layer there is no almost no output that you want which is like non negative but in positive it can go to infinity okay if you are doing a regression problem what should your output uh, output be output uh, activation be regression is a you can have any number right you can have any continuous number so your output should be a linear activation identity activation okay non linearity in in regression will come from hidden layers not from the output layer if you are doing classification by your default choice for output layer activation is going to be uh sigmoid for binary or softmax for nary n classes 
and but then you can have relu for the hidden layers non output layers then what is the uh, use of tanh so tanh and sigmoid have are they basically kind of are almost like a step function so they store like a zero bit or a one bit in some sense so tanh does it using minus 1 and 1 and softmax use or uh, sorry sigmoid does it between 0 and 1 so sigmoid can be used as a gate of some sort so you will see this in the nlp section sometimes we want to use a gate in a in a neuron and that gate is either on or off like a logic gate but it is differentiable so that you can learn the function not like a step function uh, and uh, so there sigmoid is useful but if you want to store a bit and you don't want it to be a gate then you can use a tanh function any other questions on this lecture uh chinmay sigmoid and tanh can be mathematically related yes they are very related to each other i believe tanh is uh, twice of sigmoid minus 1 ethic Uh, sir, if we uh, like do activation is equal to soft math, so it will basically tells the probability of each neuron in the list. Uh, yes, that right. In a vector, yes. So you okay. have a vector of classes, and it will tell you probability of each class. It will become a probability mass function. It will convert a linear, a linear layer, into a probability mass layer. so your theta i will be linear right so theta i is w0 x0 plus w1 x1 etc and uh, then you are converting it into a probability mass function yes so uh, so in the last layer uh, before the output layer so whenever it uh, wants the uh, output so it will judge based on based on the probability right yes so this will be the output layer softmax will be the output layer for classification thank you sir the lecture is quite important so thanks parth for covering it comprehensively and jd for chiming in this will form your basis for deep learning understanding deep learning deeply understanding deep learning if you pardon the pun okay so uh, thank you sir let's, let's take another minute or two to see if you have any questions because you should understand this this lecture very well so do you feel confident you can code a neural network from scratch that means without the libraries without the libraries yes using just numpy sir i believe to do that uh, at least we should be introduced to the concept of masks because without vectorization i think it would be a terrible uh, algorithm yes yes so that's why we introduce this jacobians that is precisely for vectorization so what what he is talking about what vectorization means is uh, that you don't run a for loop over all the neurons of a layer and compute their activations their outputs one by one you compute them using matrix algebra in one go because that makes better use of your cpu cores your multi threading and your gpu cores so it uses parallelism someone had their hand raised uh... yeah i think rithik okay uh, rithik you have a doubt uh, sir uh, uh, sir what is adam optimizer can you tell me about that so adam optimizer is a is a you, you did you understand gradient descent right yes yes gradient descent and then you did you understand did we cover momentum yet or maybe not maybe i think that's in the next lecture so it's a advanced version of gradient descent that adaptively changes the step size okay based on the some estimation of the second gradient second derivative as opposed to the just the first derivative so we will cover that i think in the next lecture okay okay thank you sir
it's just an advanced like version basically, of gradient descent yeah basically helps you escape the local minimas which you have a plenty in neural networks it is not a proper convex function right so the loss in like so it's, the, a, uh, so it's a better than sgd or that uh, remove the ambiguity that was present in the gradient descent so these are some added uh, terms that you do in the weight update so you can incorporate these in sgd as well thank you sir sir uh, there is one question yeah yeah sir uh, just like for images uh, we are uh, having image net and all this speech rnn is there will there be something for smell also just like a human complete human will be in a computer so for that the challenge is that the the sensing of different types of smells that part is not well developed yet it's not it's not widely used and probably probably the utility of it is very very specific so for example for bomb sniffers for uh, i don't know reverse engineering uh, a recipe in a kitchen or uh, perhaps for uh, maybe their like chemical compositions and so forth so it's uh, its utility is very highly specific so that's why not much effort has been put in uh, developing smell sensors as has been put it in in like microphones and cameras so when people will get bored of these things images speech recognition and all this maybe other senses will get developed so machine yeah, learning it's sensor. quite possible so now you have 3d films then you will have i don't know 7d films that will also release smell of the battle scene or smell of the of the meadow that you are looking at and so forth in in the movie theater or whatever thank you sir sound very crazy but very interesting uh, sir a small uh, uh, question actually yeah. not regarding the topic but regarding the previous topic yeah. so i see in the in the assignment provided we didn't really have to deal with i mean as far as i could see i haven't completed completely yet but uh, we didn't have to deal with audio data right yes so sir i mean uh, i don't i could not find a good uh, library on python to deal with audio yeah. data it's so actually something. yeah we intended to give you a problem on audio problem is that uh, neither sudhakar nor i have worked in audio so we couldn't figure out uh, quickly a, a, a library in python that works very easily for audio i tried to install some libraries uh, but they didn't they 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 get kept crashing on me uh, yes same sir uh, they are crashing everywhere as in uh, it was even presented on the uh, uh, on the github repo of those uh, particular libraries yeah yeah so perhaps one way to do that to work with audio might be to actually first extract the features using matlab and then import the file into python and then work with it okay sir because in Thank matlab you. it's quite yes. safe Yes, 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 sir. Thank you, sir. So, shall we call it a day then? All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, sir.